Okay, so again, once again, good morning to everyone. We are really sorry for the delay, but as you know, this is the Chaos Communication Congress. Chaos is part of the show. Um, in any case, we are uh, ready to start. Our first speaker for the day, this is a talk that I'm personally very excited about, um, very interesting in my opinion. Uh, our first speaker is an architect. Uh, he is a professor of spatial and visual cultures and the Director of uh, Forensic Architecture at Goldsmiths University in London. Please give a big round of applause to Eyal Weizmann. I'm excited to be here, my first uh, Congress actually, and I, I'm sure it's gonna bring good luck, uh, the fact that uh, we had some technical equip uh, problem right now. I'm running in London something that is better described as a counter forensic agency, as a civil society counter forensic agency. There's no better way to explain what counter forensics is. A certain turning around, repurposing uh, of the forensic gaze towards the state than looking at a series of issues where security forces or the police are the perpetrators. So what I'm going to show you today uh, very fast are three cases. The first one in Israel, second one in Germany, third one in Mexico. Each one involves violence or alleged violence by, uh, by the police. And each one also involves a different mode of research and uh, technique uh, in doing so. The first one is a place where I come from. Um, Israel, Palestine, and the issue is really um, the forced eviction of uh, Bedouin, uh, Bedouin communities that have been living in the north part of the Nakab or Negev Desert uh, in the south of Israel uh, for generations, now declared by the state uh, to be illegally occupying those places and are subject to continuous raids uh, by which the police, oh, you don't see the slides. Slides, slide, guys? Uh, okay. Sorry, one second. Um, we, we don't see, I know how you um, All right, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about forensic architecture until, until they do so. Um, basically, what we are uh, is a group of architects, filmmakers, some uh, investigative journalists, coders, and uh, we join together to uh, create um, a forensic agency. So it was a kind of an experiment that we started around 2010 um, because we felt that um, both technological and political uh, changes enabled and demanded a form of, of counter forensics that we are uh, now practicing. Initially, we were working in conflict zones. Um, the towards or, or starting really in this millennium, in the year 2000, uh, war became an urban phenomenon. Almost all conflicts that we were looking at took place in cities, uh, in and amongst buildings. So in a very straightforward way, just like um, uh, a medical doctor or physician can turn into a pathologist, we architects, uh, we're turning the tools of our trade, uh, understanding of building, a way of interpreting its materiality, its physicality, into an evidentiary technique. So initially, what we were doing was a kind of archaeology, archaeology of um, the very recent past, or archaeology of the present, uh, this is a term uh, by Gilles Deleuze, and uh, looking at piles of ruin um, of a building that was destroyed in a bomb or in a firefight, and trying to read from the disposition of the rubble something about what has taken place uh, within, sorry, uh, uh, within, within and around it. So it, it, was, it started as a kind of an archaeological practice. But, but then, then again, very often when we start working in conflict zones and the first 
projects we had were in Palestine and then in uh, we were working uh, to uncover drone warfare in the Pakistan Afghanistan frontier we realized very fast sorry you the presentation should I what the presentation on that step so we can use this laptop oh this is gonna take 20 minutes to pass them on really yeah I mean, I, because I started to put it on a stick, and um, listen, is, is, can you connect this? I'm going to do something else. This con is connected. Can you? If if this, if you can get an image from this, I'm just going to run things from my website. And do I have internet here? Is it that? So, 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 as I said, the first level of our work was archaeological, material archaeology, trying to uncover what has taken place, where people were. But increasingly, we realized that we cannot really get to the places where it was most important for us to research. Uh, that, um, that, that states, when they violate human rights or... okay. If you want, you can do Okay, thank you very much. Um, often also do two things. They close the area for um, to any investigator, any human rights group, or anyone that works to collect evidence against them, and they limit the ability of signal to come out of them. This is actually what happened in 2008, 2009 in Gaza. Very um, little signal uh, was coming out of Gaza under attack by Israeli forces. And this is what happened when the, at the beginning of the American drone strike campaign in Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, they were uh, effectively limiting it. So we, what we had to do, and this is what you're going to start seeing, is to undertake archaeology through looking at media and uh, interpreting really um, the kind of flood of social media images that were coming our way. Um, used to this um Okay, so um, the, first, the first example uh, I would like to show you is uh, work we've done uh, with a Palestinian human rights organization, al Mizan and Amnesty in Gaza in 2014. Um, we could not go. We asked for permission to go to Gaza at the time. Uh, we, our access was denied, and all we had was about 70,000 images that we have collected during that day. And what we had to do, really, is tell a story of one day, August 1st, 2014, uh, morning to, um, uh, to evening, uh, which was the, the, the most violent and the day where most Palestinian casualties were sustained. What we didn't have was the metadata on those uh, clips and images because, of course, they were harvested either from mainstream or social media. And we uh, effectively had to develop a technique to look at the bomb clouds themselves, to look at and, and compose the architecture uh, of the uh, bomb cloud plumes in order to see and collect images that refer to the same explosion and back from there to determine the time and place of each one of those bombs. So those bomb clouds were for us the metadata. They were kind of like physical metadata. Uh, here is how we geolocate um, uh, one of the images uh, that, that, uh, that we found, or one of the clips that we found. 
by comparing um, uh, points on the perspective of the uh, of the video with with what we see on a, on the satellite image, uh, located the the place where the photographer was. And by cross-referencing three of those of the same cloud, we managed to find the precise place where the bomb has finally uh, landed. So um, this, is, this is effectively a way in which you can reconstruct uh, metadata, a time-space location, uh, from what we call physical clocks, that is to say uh, analog things that exist uh, within within the image itself. Uh, however, we can see other things uh, on this photograph too. Um, if we if we look at one of those images uh, here, we have the videographer capturing two shadow lines in this photograph just a second before closing off the camera. And what we need to do is to try to establish the time. If we can establish the time on that image and we know that form of the cloud is that time, we can triangulate on and establish the, um, the times of other videos and then, and then move further. So effectively, by building a 3D model and running a sun simulation on it, uh, we could arrive at a very precise, uh, within five minutes margin of error uh, time on that image. And, uh, and now we know where this image where this video was taken and what time uh, it is uh, taken in. Um, there is, uh, however, another in, in the satellite image that we obtained, this is a kind of a very rare occasion, uh, you, we saw an actual bomb uh, on the satellite image. Again, this is something, the satellite image has metadata. Uh, and we started looking, we started hunting for that bomb in images from the ground. Again, if we could locate that, what we see in the, in the top view uh, on, from a ground view, we will be able to, um, to, to start establishing um, times on this sequence. As you see, this sequence has metadata, but the metadata is wrongly set at, at around midnight. Uh, so we compose that kind of panorama of um, uh, of the sort of the bomb clouds of of the city around around that time, and uh, we could identify that cloud. Uh, this is the cloud in uh, side view. This is it in top view. Uh, we we could find a precise location, a precise time, and then um, by confirming that is actually the same, we can move back and correct the digital metadata. So this is all techniques of of actually establishing the very basic foundational stone of, of research, time-space relations between events. Um, here, uh, for example, we could see in two different corners of the, of the web, we find those images. We can verify it's the same camera by seeing the same scratch uh, on the lens, uh, establish correct the metadata, establish the, the time difference between them, and now here, here again, the same cameraman uh, with the same scratch on the lens. And now we can compose uh, a timeline of bombs uh, during that day. And, uh, and after that, of course, these kind of cloud atlases are a technique that was used by artists and by amateur meteorologists all the way from the 19th century on. Um, what we did is creating that kind of archive of clouds. But here, what you see is that we were able to um, convert them to information on the ground and then invert the image, move from cloud to city. Uh, what you see here, the model, is something that we call the architectural image complex. Architectural models are the only ways to make sense and to place those uh, multiple images uh, in space-time uh, so that we can navigate rather than uh, edit them. We can navigate between one image and, and, and the other. Uh, what you've seen here is that on one of the images, looking so carefully at the bomb cloud, we start seeing two images in mid-fall. We found the craters where they have landed. And um, we could, uh, for our lawyers, calculate the kind of like the destruction radius there. You would see now again those uh, horrific thing to see a bomb uh, just split seconds before it land on the ground and would kill 16 Palestinians, an entire family. 
Uh, but the lawyers ask for the size of that bomb in order to bring in a kind of a supply chain uh, action on it. Um, when we see that on the on a photo frame, we can locate the photo frame within the, the model of the city and actually uh, measure those bombs uh, in a very precise, with a very small, under 10% margin of error, and then go to the catalog and find exactly which bomb it was that landed and um, that would enable activists to go after uh, the manufacturer, or after the policy of, of doing that. So again, here we are moving within uh, the model with thermodynamic specialists. We look at the way the cloud is changing in order to really realize we're looking at the same cloud. We're picking up now images and events within the city as clouds being the anchors of the reconstruction and uh, that, that project has, in fact, gone uh, later to, uh, as evidence, was submitted to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court, and was used in various other form of activism uh, on the ground, and uh, to a certain extent uh, might have contributed to uh, a change of policy by the IDF um, uh, about uh, the Hannibal Directive, so it's something that they've uh, enacted during that day. And the, the bomb cloud were also, something that was very important, were also like memory anchors. The witnesses on the ground remembered and could sequence their movement according to those bomb clouds. So think about an element that combines and ties together material evidence, media evidence, and memory evidence uh, at the same time. So, um, let's, I don't even, uh, I'm basically just improvising. It's not at all the, the lecture I wanted um, to show you um, before. Uh, here is a very recent uh, investigation we've undertaken in Cameroon. Um, and uh, where, together again with, with Amnesty International, we were able to uh, expose uh, a secret detention center uh, in, uh, run by the Cameroonian military that were Boko Haram uh, prisoners or, or suspects uh, of Boko Haram prisoners were actually tortured. Um, we had access to people in Cameroonian prisons. It is a very rare occasion. We were able to actually uh, send questions back and forth and reconstruct uh, the, uh, the architecture and the, of the prison and the conditions of incarceration. But what became very important through the questions that we continuously posed and continuously received from uh, those suspects is that they've actually uh, seen, um, and at the beginning we, we did not know if this was uh, correct or not. They were obviously seeing people being tortured and killed outside of their detention center. But at some point, they also confirmed seeing uh, something different. Uh, American soldiers uh, that were uh, present on the site. Now, as you know, the US has claimed that it has stopped rendition, it has stopped involvement uh, in torture. But uh, this is something that um, we started uh, very closely digging in to see whether we could find any traces of US soldiers and other European militaries uh, involved uh, within that um, uh, uh, sort of incarceration and, or, and torture of Boko Haram uh, suspect. First thing that we saw, that we noticed was, um, and sometimes traces are left in the most kind of um, uh, unexpected of places, a contract, an American contract to connect that base to the internet. The minute that we saw that, that was on the public domain, we started following on Facebook and uh, seeing some American soldiers actually forgot to disconnect the, the location tagging. And you know, they're kind of like holiday photographs uh, could be very uh, easily located uh, onto the base. Again, we've built a model of the base in order to confirm precisely where each one of the photographs uh, was taken, and that we can see that they had access to the entire base. Again, a base where people are executed, tortured, um, uh, etc., and, and and then track the unit and. Um, and as you see, the, 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 the site is actually under construction, something that is 
that we could not believe seeing was American soldiers training uh, the unit that uh, is doing those atrocities. And here in this almost comical uh, film, they train them in night vision equipment by uh, playing football. So they all play football in the dark with night vision. Uh, and you could see that, that the sort of the involvement is, is very, um, uh, very direct. So that, that, uh, the exposure of that base led to um, a sort of a full American uh, at the beginning, denial, always denial, uh, then admission, then now a full investigation by the by, by the U.S. about this um, a, these allegations. Um, another important case that we were involved with recently is the Ayotzinapa case. I think uh, maybe many of you know. Um, the uh, the story of um, um, the, the 43 students, Mexican students, uh, that uh, were forcefully disappeared uh, in Mexico. Um, we were asked by the parents and by other civil society group uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, investigate that. Um, it's one of the biggest controversies in Mexico right now, uh, still, although it's three years since the disappearance. Um, students um, involved in very uh, grassroots left-wing politics entered into a city that was very much uh, involved in uh, narcos trade and were destroyed by the police, the military, and, and, and organized crime. What we've done here is not really collect new evidence, but look at thousands and thousands of existing reports and wanting, in fact, to data mine them. Um, there were you know, hundreds and thousands of documents, and the only way to, uh, to make sense of them was actually to look at relations between different events in space-time, the relations between all phone calls, photographs, movements of cars, and gunshot started creating a very different picture than the Mexican government has actually was willing to admit, uh, and that is that um, um, there was some local uh, gang or, or local sort of uh, organized crime group that was uh, in charge of, uh, of these actions. So we created a, a platform in which we placed every uh, named actor uh, in space-time, a timeline, and all the communication so that we could start seeing relation between evidence. Often, it's not the, a, a bit of evidence in itself. It's not uh, the casing or a gunshot uh, that, that matters, but actually uh, patterns, coordinations, and uh, patterns of escalations, uh, and other things that, that actually expose uh, what, uh, what was going on. And we could show, really, uh, a direct involvement between three uh, different police forces um, uh, and the, the military and organized crime uh, at the same time. The location of all CCTV cameras that were there and removed um, and... Um, uh, and and, and it's somehow the relationship between phone calls and uh, and attacks became most uh, clear indication of command and control, i.e. Uh, that they, the, these events were actually coordinated by the police. Here uh, we, we are analyzing CCTV uh, cameras uh, and, and what they would have seen, of course, the state immediately after the event erased every CCTV camera that existed that was available uh, in the city and they said, oh, they didn't show anything. We could show exactly what they would have uh, shown uh, at, that, uh, at that moment. Another uh, element to this is um, we go, so this is the platform. You can actually go and, and, and explore it yourself. Um, rather than a sort of like a work with images, as I said, this is a work uh, with data. And one of the most uh, important um, drawing, uh, and in fact became one of the uh, very influential drawing during that, um, uh, in our investigation, 
was a kind of a working drawing that we uh, kept uh, for ourselves because we had to keep track of where every uh, agent was, uh, what was the relationship between them, and also the multiple narratives uh, that were told. So we kind of kept a very, very long drawing at the office, um, plotting the movement of different actors, uh, until at some point we realized that what we were drawing, that working drawing, became in fact in fact, an image of disappearance. Because disappearance is not about, and forced disappearance of people is not only about grabbing people, um, killing them, and hiding the bodies. Disappearance is also uh, an attack on evidence. It's the con continuous withdrawal and destruction of evidence. It is the introduction of false narratives and uh, subterfuge. Uh, so, a disappearance is, in fact, a narrative form in itself. And, um, and so, so here, that drawing, we could actually kind of like uh, show how the state narrative here in black, I'm, I'm not going to go exactly into what everything means because we lost a lot of time in this um, presentation, but um, these are the movement of uh, of the students according to the state narrative, a state narrative that is uh, still officially holding, although it's being currently revised uh, in response to, uh, to, to many things, but including also our, uh, our investigation. And, um, and now you would see the, 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 the victim, uh, the survivor's uh, narrative, uh, completely different. Uh, starts, they, they enter the city at a completely different time, uh, they move uh, through it, and, um, and the, 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 the divergence between the black and the red narrative, in fact, is the space of denial and disappearance. Disappearance as, as, as an ongoing crime, disappearance as a crime, uh, on narrative, uh, etc. I'm going to skip forward just so that you can see how the uh, the drawing is built up with uh, another here on top. The 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 purple images are uh, the purple lines are those uh, of the narcos, uh, and um, so each one tells a different story, and and the multiple stories are in fact the. Um, that, that kind of space of disappearance. Here you would see these are movements of police throughout the city, and uh, you would see how that police force is precisely next to the students all throughout the attack and um, moving along uh, with them. Uh, in fact, what we have finally done and this is now green is the military uh, etc. is is built that we we knew about the um, the uh, up, uh, yeah where is it mural so this is this is the complete drawing that we've actually printed as an enormous mural. In Mexico, murals are kind of sites of political pedagogy. You can think about Diego Rivera's great murals uh, in, in Mexico and the US, where there are narratives about the history of the state and about the struggle of the working class. In a certain sense, we thought that this is a kind of a mural of the uh, 20th century, uh, 21st century, if you like, a kind of a data mural that is complicated to read, but its complication is in fact the image of disappearance. These, the entangled line and interruptions within it is what makes um, that space um, hold on exhibition. I want to show you the, uh, the image uh, of that mural uh, in the space. And it has become, ever since, a kind of a site uh, of political assembly and political activism, of protest uh, for the families and, uh, and others. 
and um, and it kind of shows for us the use of uh, of cultural and art spaces in the context of our work. Uh, indexes another problem in counter forensic. Very often, our evidence cannot enter the very official spaces of state justice. They cannot. Um, it's very rare that one can actually take uh, the state uh, or challenge the state legally in its own institutions. What we need to establish are alternative forums, and for us, these could be. Uh, public spaces, exhibitions, uh, etc. I think may, some of you might know about the work that we've done uh, on the NSU, on the um, Teme or the uh, Verfassungsschutz uh, agent that was suspected to be present in an internet cafe in Kassel during the time of a racist killing and us showing that uh, he, he was there, he could not have uh, missed the, uh, this, this event that was presented in Documenta and Documenta offered for us another very interesting forum that the fact it was uh, shown there has in fact mobilized um, the process including in the uh, federal in, in a federal Ger in a German federal investigation and also in a Hessen parliamentary uh, investigation uh, where different delegations from these uh, uh, from 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 this parliamentary investigation actually came to Documenta to see it and finally that work uh, was presented to uh, Teme. Um, uh, he was forced to look at it and to comment um, upon it. I think. Uh, I should probably leave some time to question. I'm sorry about the chaotic uh, presentation, but I guess this is the nature of this uh, of this event. So I'm happy to have had at least a chance to present to you some some work. Thanks for listening. So uh, thank you, Eyal, for a very interesting talk, despite all the, the difficulties. No problem. If you have any questions, then there are four microphones here in the center aisle and two on the side, and you can line up uh, and ask your questions. And first question, number microphone number one. Uh, how much has uh, any official state tried to shut down your investigations because it hit a nerve? Um, well, this is... Uh, Shutdown is is a kind of is a complicated uh, term. First of all, we, we we face interruptions initially in not being allowed access to sites, and this is very much uh, the question in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, our investigators, when they land in Tel Aviv airport, sometimes are interrogated, sometimes they turn turn around. Um, Nothing of that is, is uh, comparable to what uh, the Israeli state would have done if these were Palestinians uh, trying to, to do the same thing. So to a certain extent, uh, me being uh, an Israeli Jew, uh, I'm, I'm privileged by the, uh, by the state and the attempt is to use those privileges um, to undo those privileges to a certain extent. Um, we continuously had um, interruptions from the FBI, for example, when we did the white phosphorus research on that included work on um, their attack in Fallujah, Iraq, with white phosphorus. Uh, we had some of our collaborators in the U.S.'s home being raided. Uh, we have, um, you know, we kind of like being trolled and threatened, um, a, but. It, it's it's a kind of a continuous sort of dance of us being to kind of protect our staff, protect our data, and attempts to penetrate it, attempts to smear us on the public domain, and um, few, very little victories sometimes. Microphone four. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, two-part question here. Uh, the first one is about the framework. If you develop it, especially for this case, if you have it available, if you are doing new ones for each research, if you use one. And the second part is how do you sustain yourself financially? 
Uh, okay, actually it's the same question because uh, our aim is to develop new evidentiary techniques so we kind of never do the same investigation twice or we never use the same methodologies twice. Uh, what we do after we develop any software is that we put it on a, uh, on a public domain, we, we uh, put it as an open source code and um, we, or if it is kind of techniques of more architectural or editing image-based techniques, we, we have academies, we teach uh, activists how to do it. So we try, whenever we work with partners on the ground, to leave capacity uh, behind us. And that is also uh, the reason, or, or what enables this to us is that we are sustained on research grants uh, rather than... Uh, only on commissions, although, you know, I mean, if, if um, a prosecutor, human rights group, or any other civil society group would like to uh, commission us, we would, um, they, they, they would pay for part of the investigation, but um, the large part of it is actually research grants that are translated into open source stuff, and, and, uh, and the, uh, the investigations are being put on a public domain. It's kind of, when you look at our videos, they're a little bit like cooking programs, because they both tell you what we find, and they tell you exactly how to do it. It's kind of take you step by step. This is what you do here, then that, then this, etc., etc. Like the phone number four. Thank you so much for your work on this. Um, my question is like, how would any of us be able to get like, involved in this and, and support you in one way or another? Uh, we, in, in fact, uh, we are now about. 15 architects, coders, and, uh, and and filmmakers, and we are recruiting because we're growing. We uh, and uh, I will stay here for the day. So anyone that wants to come and work with us in London or remotely, I'll be delighted to speak to you. Yes, sir. from four. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about which tools we use, uh, about which techniques and tools we use to perform the 3D reconstruction, and if you partner with any kind of company that already has that data and already does um, in mass 3D reconstruction as a baseline. Uh, we started doing now uh, photogrammetry as, as, as 3D reconstruction from. Uh, existing uh, open source images. So imagine, you know, a place in Syria, let's say, that has been photographed uh, or videoed for by, by many users. Uh, we were able, we are able to reconstruct it. In fact, this is one of the techniques we use in order to identify the gas attack on Khan Shahdun in, in, in Syria by the regime forces, uh, reconstructing precisely to the millimeter the shape of the crater and, and we were able to reconstruct from it the level of explosives, etc., that, and that they were fitting only that uh, particular uh, rocket. Um, we don't really work together with companies. We try to take existing softwares and kind of like adjust them uh, to our to our aim. But initially what I want to leave you with is the kind of the question of why architecture, why architecture is really important here. At a situation, in a situation when you don't have only like two images of, of a scene, let's say police brutality or an attack on a city, etc., but you have 70,000 and you need to um, cross-reference them and you need to place them within a space, the only way to do it is in architectural models. Architecture is like the optical device that allows us to sync up and locate you know, those cameras that are in space and moving uh, in space. So uh, it is really uh, the kind of the, the necessity of work of architects, filmmakers, and coders is fundamental because uh, space replaces the kind of modernist montage as a relation to images. Montage is the edits in the film that is kind of, you know, the basic of cinema, of political cinema, the dialectic montage, if you like, you splice film and put it together. That makes no sense for us because we need to move within space, pick up one film, not to cut it. We never cut the films that we are. We just leave them within the model in their full duration, but the investigator can move and navigate in space and time between them. And as I showed you in the Mexico case, 
you know, these are like tens and tens of, uh, of uh, thousands of data points that uh, create kind of intersections between data, image, and architecture that uh, where the story starts to be, uh, to, to unfold at all. So, yeah. More questions? Microphone three. Um, when you publish the videos and the time and place from which they were taken, how do you ensure that you do not put in, in danger the people who took the videos? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, we, uh, the, the work to sync up those 70,000 images from Gaza were, uh, took us a year. Think about it. A year, we're working a year on one day. That's about the right kind of ratio in forensic time that we are that we operating within it what protects people during war and during when they'll do it will never place their location uh, but um, months after the conflict um, it was deemed um, by our partners in Palestine and by our partners in uh, Amnesty that this is safe uh, to do without going back to each source and, uh, and in fact asking them. We would never do it in real time though. Microphone four. Yes. Um, the work you do strikes me as very similar to what Bellingcat do. Yeah. So um, can you comment on how forensic architecture um, compares to Bellingcat? No, we work a lot with Bellingcat and Elliot. I mean, some, some of our projects are, uh, are together. I guess that our, um, the difference is not, um, we, we engage more in sort of a big environment and kind of like data analysis from um, many uh, sort of data points where architecture, or architectural models are the kind of the arena that holds and cross-reference all those uh, images together. The overlap in our work really is a kind of image identification, what do we see, where the image is located, etc. And, um, and on these issues we work with them together. Uh, we tend to work more um, against states, western states, militaries. Um, uh, holding them to account, we feel, is, uh, is that these techniques are actually much more useful directed at the British, American, Israeli militaries, uh, and that we are able also to draw responses that are uh, effective in, in these fields. Uh, and I guess Bellingcat has a slightly different sort of um, uh, field uh, in which they work. Okay, I think with that, uh, that will be our last question. So again, a big round of applause to Eyal for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.